Okay, so today we're looking at section P-5. We're going to solve equations graphically, numerically, and also algebraically. <clears throat> so we're going to hit everything. So pay attention to the directions and what they want you to do within that. So the, for the first equation, we're going to solve that graphically, and then they ask you to confirm algebraically, so you really have to do both. So we're going to start off, um, and if you're watching the video, you're not going to see my calculator. Sorry, you'll have to listen to the commands. So take your calculator. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> Go into y equals and put in the equation. You've got to make sure that equation has zero on one side in order to put into y equals. This one does. It's going to do 2x. You can use the squared button or you can use your caret. Either way. So 2x squared minus 3x. Make sure that you're using the minus and not the negative and then minus 2. So if your calculator says a syntax error or something like that and it won't graph it, it's probably because you use the negative rather than the subtraction sign. So hit graph. And when we are solving graphically, we are looking for where that graph crosses the x-axis. So we're looking for these places right here. What are those things called? Zeros. <laughs> So the x-intercepts are your zeros. That's the solution to the equation. In this case, the graph shows it. It doesn't matter where it crosses the y-axis. It really only matters where it crosses that x-axis. So we're going to find those zeros using your calculator. Because I can only estimate that the right zero looks like 2, and the left zero looks less than negative 1. So we want to know exactly. So where do I find, or how do I calculate those zeros? Where do I go on my calculator? second calc. So you're going to do second calc, choose zero as your option, and it's going to ask you left bound. Well, sometimes with zeros it's hard to tell what's left and right, so if this is your zero, left is actually above the x-axis. So you only want to use your right and left cursor. You don't want to go up and down, so I'm going to cursor to the left, so I get above the x-axis, and I'm going to hit enter. Then I'm going to cursor to the right, and that brings me below the x-axis. I want you to notice what the y value is doing every time you cursor back and forth from the left to the right side of that zero. Originally, if we went up here left, see how my y value is positive? And as I cursor right, what happened to my y value now? It went negative. So we're looking for a sign change. Your calculator is looking for a sign change when you hit that second enter. If there's no sign change, your calculator is going to tell you, it's going to give you some sort of error message. And then when you hit enter that third time, that's when the error message will occur if you didn't create that sign change by going left bound, right bound. And so uh, that's actually a fairly decent zero, negative 0 0.50, so that's negative a half. So I'm going to write that down here. So my zeros. And I'm going to write them as ordered pairs, because we're going to plot them here in a minute, would be negative, in my book, negative 0.5 is negative 1 half, comma 0. And then we're going to find the second 0. So we're just going to go through that same process again. So we're going to go to second calc, select 0. And then you've got to scroll left bound. So I want to get close to where it's crossing the x-axis on the right. So I'm going to scroll right past that minimum point, the vertex, and get a little bit closer to where that zero is. Now hit enter. And then scroll to the right some more to get above the line. Hit enter. And hit enter a third time. Two zero should be your zero. Did everybody get that? Anybody having issues finding those zeros? Okay, make sure that you're bringing your graphing calculator to school so that you can practice using it here. And so those are our zeros, the, um, and we're going to go ahead and plot those on the x-axis. So here's my left zero, and here's my right zero. And then I always like to plot um, the minimum value, so we're going to just practice finding that minimum value. Why is this a minimum and not a maximum? because it's got a valley, right? That's the lowest point possible. So where do I calculate the minimum value? Second calc again, that has a lot of 
things that it can do for you. So calculate minimum. If you try to do maximum, your calculator is going to give you an error message because it won't is looking for certain things and it knows that that's not a maximum. So once left bound, is my cursor currently left of the minimum? No. So I'm going to cursor left until I get to the left, not too far away from it. Hit enter. Then cursor to the right. Hit enter. And then hit enter a third time. And it's not a very pretty minimum, but we'll work with it. So the minimum is 0.75. minimum, which is my vertex. That's, I don't know why I put a MIV. Let's try that again. <laughs> I'm really having issues. I'm just going to start all over again. M-I-N. I can do it. All right, so my x value is 0 0.75, which is 3 fourths, comma, negative 3.125. So we're going to approximate that on here as best as we can. So to the right, 3 fourths, and down just a smidgey below negative 3. So that's about where my minimum is. And then you can actually read where your y-intercept is, but if you, just by looking at your equation. So looking at my equation, as long as this is 0, I can read my y-intercept. So if I plug in 0 for x, because we know on your y-intercept that your 0 value is going to be x. Have you not heard that yet? Oh, you haven't heard that one yet, have you? It's my lightsaber. So if... <laughs> I'm like, why are you all laughing? Oh, yeah. But then I can have my multi-talented lightsaber, this one, where I can change its direction. It's very exciting. <laughs> so, the things that make a teacher... Ex <laughs> um, so, for your y-intercept, x should be 0. So, if I let x here be 0, won't all of that be 0? And if I let x here be 0, won't all of that be 0? So, all that's left is a negative 2. So, whatever your constant is, as long as the right side is 0, or one of your sides is 0, whatever the constant is, that's your y-intercept. But how else could you find it via your calculator? Where do you go? Second table, yeah. So second table. Oh, my, my table's all messed up, so hang on. Let me quickly fix my table set. Da, da, da. Okay, so here I would put in zero for my x value, and lo and behold, didn't we get our constant of negative two? And so I'm going to graph that. And so I'm going to put a green line through all of those and a, just sketch my parabola. Isn't that the graph of a parabola? But really what we're interested in is where did this cross the x-axis? Those two points. Those are my solutions right there. So my solutions would be these here. So my solution... Really? That's really awful. So my solutions would be x equaling negative 1 half comma 2. If we were to solve this algebraically, that's what we should get. And it does say confirm algebraically. So we're going to do the algebra. Since we've already gone over factoring, I'm going to assume that we can factor. But we're going to have to factor this trinomial here by taking the bookends 2 and negative 2 and multiplying them together, which is negative 4. Because it's negative, we'll subtract the factors of 4. What factors of 4 subtract to give me 3? 4 and 1. So then we would rewrite this middle term so we would have 2x squared. It would be a minus 4x, a plus 1x, and then a minus 2. And then you have to group the first two, group the second two, take out the GCF, all that fun stuff, right? Well, when all is said and done, this is what you end up with. So algebraically, this would factor into x minus 2 
times 2x plus 1 equals 0. Then what do you do with each of these binomials to solve? What do you do with them? Set them equal to 0. So we're going to take the x minus 2 and set it equal to 0, and the 2x plus 1 and set it equal to 0 and solve. So for the left one, we're going to add 2. So I get x equals 2. And for the right one, I'm going to subtract 1. And I'm going to divide by 2. And so my two solutions are x equals 2 and negative 1 half. Are those the solutions that we came up with earlier? Yeah. So they are the same, and they match. So I confirmed it algebraically. Just pay attention to the directions. You don't have to do that for everything, just if they ask for it. Yeah, but that's not considered confirming algebraically. So watch that because on your quiz you're going to have that or your test, you're going to have that. And so you've got to show the factoring part of it. Now, that's more like a check. Well, if it checks, I shouldn't have to confirm it algebraically. Well, we want you to test your algebra as well. All right, so any questions on that? Are we good? Okay. So then let's look at example two. Example two, we're just solving algebraically, so no calculator. You can check it on your calculator by subtracting 9 from each side, so you have 0 on one side, and you can plug that whole thing into your y equals on your calculator and graph it. And wherever it crosses the x-axis are your solutions. So you could check it graphically, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to do the algebra. Um, notice a couple things. Thing one, this is a perfect square binomial, mostly because that's a square there, right? And it doesn't matter that this is a perfect square, it doesn't have to be. But I want to get the x out from these parentheses. So how do I do that without having to multiply 2x minus 1 times 2x minus 1? Take the square root of both sides. And when you take the square root of both sides, remember on the other side you have to do plus or minus. So for step 1, we're going to do the square root of... two x minus one squared equals plus or minus the square root of nine. So when I take the square root of a squared binomial, what do I get? Yeah, I just get that two x minus one. So two x minus one equals, and then we can take the square root of nine. So we get plus or minus three, yep. And then when you go to solve for 1, be careful. Because when I add, or when I go to solve for x, when I add 1 to both sides, you have to add it in front of that plus minus. That's really an arrow. You have to add it in front of the plus minus. This is an arrow right here. Sorry. If you don't add it in front of the plus minus, you try to add that 1 to the 3. That 3 is really two values. It's a positive 3 and a negative 3. And it gets confusing if you try to do that. So add it in front of that plus minus so that you get... 2x is equal to 1 plus or minus 3, and we'll deal with that in a minute. And then finally, to solve for x, you're going to divide by 2. So we get a value of x. What's 1 plus 3? 4, Four divided by 2? Two. 2, comma. What's 1 minus 3? Negative 2 divided by 2? Negative 1. And so our solution is 2 and negative 1. So I would anticipate that if I were to put that into my y equals on my calculator after I subtracted 9, and this is how I would check it, that it should cross the, uh, and you can do this on your calculator right now if you want to, it should cross the x-axis at positive 2 and negative 1. Did anybody throw that into their calculator? No, because that would be too much work. <laughs> I'm going to be lazy. All right. I'm going to let you be lazy, but trust me, it works. All right, look at example three. We're doing a lot of review today and just various little ways to solve equations. So we're going to now solve by completing the square. You could solve this by factoring and doing 4 times 17 
and then it's a, it's positive, so you would add the factors of whatever 4 times 17 is until you get 20, and you could do the whole rewriting the trinomial group and garbage, all that kind of stuff. But it's specifically asking for completing the square. So we need to review the rules of completing the square. Anybody know what rule one would be? What are the things you have to do to complete the square? We are trying to get an equation that looks like example <coughs> two right here. We're trying to get this. After we complete the square, we'll have something that looks like this. It might not be as pretty as that, but we're going to have something that look like, looks like that with a squared binomial on the left and some number on the right. Yes? Correct. So the very first thing we have to do is get rid of that constant. So step one, we're going to subtract the 17 from both sides. So we get 4x squared minus 20x equals a negative 17. So that was step one. Then the second step involves the coefficient of the squared term. Can the coefficient of the squared term be 4? Well, because I'm asking that question, the logic person would say, uh, no. So that's the correct answer. It has to be 1. So you can never have a coefficient for your squared term other than 1. So we're going to have to get rid of that by dividing every term here every term, whether or not 4 goes into it, every term by 4. So this is where it could get kind of ugly. I probably personally wouldn't choose to complete the square with this particular problem because of the negative 17 fourths. But I don't have that choice because they're making me do it, right? So then step 2, we're going to go ahead and perform that division. So we get x squared minus 5x, and then please put in here a plus blank equals negative 17 fourths plus blank. The blank is for the completing of the square. And we're going to create a nice perfect square that's going to go in that blank and you're going to add it to both sides so that you don't change the value of the equation itself. To make that perfect square, we're going to find C, which is the constant. So we're going to put a brand new C in there. That C is found by taking B, the coefficient of the x term, dividing it by 2 and squaring it. Remember that? b divided by 2 squared. And it really doesn't matter whether you take the sine of b or not. And in this case, isn't b a negative 5? So you can put a negative 5 here or a positive 5. It honestly doesn't matter because what happens when you square a positive and a negative? you're going to get a positive no matter what. So this number right here, 100% of the time, has to be a positive number, always. So you can go ahead and put that negative 5 in there if you want to, and, I, and I'm going to go ahead and do it for demonstration purposes. I usually tend to skip it because it doesn't matter, but for some people that will freak them out. So then this squared gives you 25 fourths. So we're going to add 25 fourths onto each line. And now, we're <clears throat> I am totally losing my voice, and now we're ready to complete the square. So we have created this perfect square trinomial right here. Perfect square trinomials factor as one parentheses squared. So I'm going to prepare it for its factoring. So step three, it should factor as one set of parentheses squared equals something else. We're going to get just something that looks just like example two before we solved it. So to figure out what goes in the parentheses here, take your bookends, and we did this when we um, reviewed factoring, take your bookends and take their square roots. So square root of x squared is x, so an x goes here, square root of 25 fourths, take the square root of both the numerator and the denominator, 5 halves. So we get an x and a 5 halves, and then to determine the sign that goes in the middle here, Whatever the sign of the middle term is, goes here. So every one of these three terms gives something to the parentheses. The bookends, they give you their square roots. The middle term gives it sign. So because the middle term was negative, the sign in the middle is negative. And then equals 25, or, uh, 
not 25 fourths, but what's <coughs> negative 17 and positive 25? They have the same denominator, which is nice. So what's negative 17 and positive 25? 8 divided by 4? 2. So hopefully you're okay with me just putting a 2 there. Now doesn't it look like example 2 above? So how do you solve it? So we use completing the square to get and make it a problem that looks like number 2. So what did we do in number 2 above? Took the square root of both sides. So that's step 4. So step 4, I'm going to take the square root of x minus 5 halves squared equals, and don't forget on the right side we have to do plus or minus the square root of 2. Don't let it bother you that 2 is not a perfect square. It doesn't have to be. Our whole purpose was for that left side to be a nice squared binomial so we could take its square root. So when you perform the square root, you get x, I don't even need parentheses, let's take that away. So I get x minus 5 halves is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2. If that right side's not a perfect square, then simplify it as far as possible, and that is simplified. And then from here, we're going to add 5 halves and add 5 halves. I personally would not mark you off for writing this as your answer. x equals 5 halves plus or minus the square root of 2. But your book is not going to have that as an answer. Your book is going to want that answer to be written in one fraction. So you've got to combine these into one fraction. So in order to do that, I've got to put the square root of 2 over 1. So I'm going to put this over 1. And what's the LCD? Between 2 and 1. 2. So that means that the radical 2 has to be multiplied by 2 to the top and the bottom. And your final answer, x is equal to 5 plus or minus 2 radical 2, all of that over 2. And this becomes your answer. All right, so, well, that's loud. <laughs> so that's our solution. Um, and um, if you were to plot this, um, well, if you were to plot this on your calculator, if you wanted to check it, you have to take this and take 5 plus 2 times the square root of 2, enter, divided by 2, enter, and get that decimal. And then um, look at your graph and go to second calc and find the zeros. And that should be one of your decimals. I cannot cancel this 2 into that 2 because you can't cancel anything in a fraction that's being added or subtracted to something else. So if this 5 were a 10, let's say, then I could cancel the 5, the 2, and or I'm sorry, the 10, the 2, and the 2, all by the same number. So you've got to have this triangle of numbers. They all have to be divisible by the same thing in order to cancel. So don't go and cancel those 2s. How come I can't cancel the 2 into the 2 that's underneath the radical? You can't. Right, you can't cancel something that's outside of a radical with something that's inside of a radical. They cannot communicate or talk to each other. So that's your final answer. Any issues, problems, or concerns with that? Don't you love completing the square? Now your answer to this completing the square is going to bring us to what our solution should look like when you use a quadratic formula. And quite honestly, I would have used a quadratic formula for this particular problem here because 4 did not divide into 17. If I don't get a nice, happy number when I divide out that uh, coefficient, I don't, if given a choice, I would not have completed the square there. It's just not a nice problem. So let's look at example four. So if we're going to use the quadratic formula, you have to know the equation or the formula to the quadratic formula. And if you don't, we have a nice little song that goes with it. If you've had me before, you know the song and you remember it, don't you? You'll never forget the quadratic formula if you sing the song. Nelson, I think, I taught her the song. She sings it, too. Um, so I'm not going to, if I talk and write at the same time, I'll write it wrong. So we'll sing here in a minute. All 
Alright, so A, B, and C in this formula re refer to the coefficient of the squared term, the x term, and the constant. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But here's your formula. If you look this up on YouTube for quadratic formula songs, they all sing them wrong, every single one of them. I haven't found one that sings them correctly. And it refers to this thing in front of B. I realize it's a negative, but it's not read that way. It's read the opposite of B. And so our song is sung to the Pop Goes the Weasel. Are you ready? I'll sing it once by myself because I'm the next American Idol, but then you can sing it yourself, and you're going to be far worse than me. I'm just going to share with you. All right, so here it goes. The opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. It's quite catchy. <laughs> if you want to know your parents, just keep singing it over and over and over and over again because if they yell at you, just say, hey, I'm studying for my pre-calc test. Are you telling me not to study? <laughs> Don't you judge me. All right, so here you go. You get to sing it on your own, and you're all together. I just did it by myself. So you can't be embarrassed. Here you go. One, two, three. The opposite. That was much better than period three. They were terrible. You guys were actually pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay. So um, keep singing that because you don't get that on your test. You have to know it. It's, it's assumed that you know it. Um, before we can use a quadratic formula, one side of your equation must be zero. Do I have that here? No. So step one is going to be to write the equation so that one side is equal to zero. So we're going to subtract that five from both sides. So we get 3x squared minus the 6x, but we have a minus 5 so that one side is equal to 0. And then if I were you, I would physically list out what is A, what is B, what is C. So what is A? 3. And B? Negative 6. Signs are really important, so make sure you pay attention to those signs. And C? Negative 5. So, whoops, that's a terrible 5. So then all you're going to do is rewrite your quadratic formula as a template. I'm going to remove all the A's, B's, and C's and leave the negatives, the operation symbols, grouping symbols, the square root, everything there, but I'm just removing the A's, B's, and C's. So step two is to plug and chug. Plug and chug. So I like to sing <laughs> as I'm writing my template because it helps. The opposite of B, plus I sound like a crazy teacher, plus or minus the square root of, and I'm using substitution parentheses, B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So if you do your homework at Paradise Bakery or at the library and you're singing to yourself, people are just going to think you're a real happy math camper. All right, so we're going to plug in the opposite of B, so we would put in a negative 6 into here and then also a negative 6 into here. Minus 4a is 3, c is a negative 5, all over 2a is a 3. So at this point I've just pared it down to now it's just math. And so from here we're just going to simplify. Do little pieces at a time. Too much in your head, less in your head, more on paper kill a tree. You can replant the tree. It's okay. So the opposite of negative 6 is really positive 6, plus or minus the square root of negative 6 squared is 36. And then when you get to this point, this is where the most errors occur. <coughs> count your negatives between these three numbers. Count how many negatives you have. So I've got two negatives. Is that going to be a positive or a negative? A positive. So you've got 4 times 3 is 12. What's 12 times 5? 60. So I've got a positive 60 all over 6. I cannot cancel the 6 with the 6 because there's supposed to be a triangle of numbers here. There's supposed to be something in front of the plus minus. There would have to be a number behind the plus minus and then the 6. So that's your triangle of numbers that you're looking to see. Do they have something in common? Well, right now, what's this number? A 1. A 1, a 6, and a 6 do not have anything in common. You cannot cancel them. 
So then 36 plus 60 is, mm -hmm. so we get 96 all over 6. I still can't cancel the 6s. Then we're going to prime factor 96. 96 is essentially 32 times 3, and 32 has 5 twos. So we get the square root of, oh, I don't want that yet. That's what happens when I don't sing to myself. 6 plus or minus the square root of 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and a 3. All over 6. So now I can simplify that. How many groups of 2 can I pull out? So 1, 2. So that's 2 times 2 is 4. Now we're talking. I've got 6 plus or minus 4. Square root of, I've got a 2 and a 3 left over underneath. That leaves a 6 underneath, all over 6. Now look at your triangle, <coughs> Superman triangle of numbers. Superman has like a triangle on his chest, right? Superman triangle of numbers. And so what does the 6, the 4, and the 6 have in common? A 2. So I want you to think of it this way. Essentially, I'm pulling a uh, uh, greatest common factor of 2 out in front here. So they all have that in common. So I really have a 2 <coughs> times 3 plus or minus 2 square root of 6 all over 6. And that's why I'm canceling the 2 with everything. And so my actual final, final answer is 3 plus or minus 2 radical 6 all over 6. Oh, yeah, 3. Yeah, yeah. It probably won't let me. Oh, maybe it will let me erase. Yes, it does. Woohoo. Now, I cannot cancel anything else with these three numbers. They have nothing else in common, and I cannot cancel the three into that six. <coughs> We're done. Now, if you wanted to check this, you'd have to actually find the decimal equivalency of three plus two red six, all divided by three and 3 minus 2 red 6 all divided by 3. Those are your two separate zeros, and that's where your graph would cross the x-axis at those two places if you were to put this equation right here into your y equals. All right, any issues, problems, or concerns with that? Perfect. Flip it. All right, so for example five, we're solving just graphically, which implies that you're going to use your calculator. And then um, example six below that also deals with the same equation. So do I have zero on one side? Yeah, so I'm going to switch my calculator view for those of you in the class. Okay, so we're ready to just put that x cubed minus x minus one into the y equals on your calculator. So go to y equals. Clear out what's in there, and then you're going to put x, you have to use your caret, which is below that clear button on the right side, x caret 3. If you have a newer calculator, you have to write cursor out of that exponent in order to put in the rest of it. Minus x, make sure you're using the minus and not the negative, minus 1. So if you hit graph and it gives you a syntax error of some sort or just some sort of error message, it means you probably use the negative key instead of the subtraction key. We all good? Hit graph. How many times does this cross the x-axis? Once. So we only have one solution, and that's where it's crossing the x-axis. So we're going to go ahead and um, sketch this. In order to sketch it, um, I need to know where it's hitting the um, y-axis, the x-axis, and then for the max and the min, because I'm not ultra concerned, so long as you don't do big, huge ups and downs, because obviously the max and mins on here, the relative max and mins, are not big, huge swoops. So long as you don't do that, I am okay with that. But I want to see where does it cross the x and the y axis. So this x-intercept is called a what? A zero. That's your solution, right? So you're going to do second calc, choose zero. And it's saying left bound. Are you to the left of the zero? Where if I were you, I would get past that minimum point if that's where they put your little flashing dot. 
but you want to stay below the x-axis. That's the left side of the zero on this case is below the x-axis. And notice that your y value is negative, right? And then hit enter. Then cursor to the right till you're above, and now notice your y value went positive. Your calculator is looking for that change in sign. Hit enter, and hit enter a third time. And we've got one point, let's round to two decimal places, so 1.3 two. So my zero has an x value of 1.32 comma zero. So that's going to end up being my solution. And we're going to plot that somewhere between one and two. I'm not ultra picky if you don't get it in exactly the right spot. Um, but just looking at the equation, what's my y-intercept? negative 1, right? So I know that my y-intercept is 0, negative 1. So I'm going to plot that. And I'm going to put a green line as an, an estimate of what my, my graph actually looks like. So that's a close enough sketch of what we see. And so we can actually write our solution because writing the zero doesn't tell me that you know that that's your solution. So we're going to go ahead and write here x is equal to 1.32. And it's really a squiggly equals because we approximated. So technically that should be a squiggly equals. So if that's all we had to do, it'd be so, your homework would be so quick. It's the algebra that takes the long, long part, unfortunately. And then I put right below this question an agreement about approximating your solutions, because we just approximated a solution. And it says here for word problems, you're going to round to a value that's reasonable for the context of the problem. So if we're talking about boxes of Girl Scout cookies, you would round to the nearest box of Girl Scout cookies because you can't eat a partial, well, you can't buy a partial box of Girl Scout cookies. I beg to differ if you can eat a partial box of Girl Scout cookies because once you start, it's hard to stop. But that's where we could have an argument. But you, can, you cannot go to the Girl Scout and go, I'd like to buy 1.32 boxes of cookies because that poor little Girl Scout is going to scratch her head and go, what? <laughs> you can only buy them in whole increments. So that's what that part means. For all other problems, round to two decimal places unless directed otherwise. So because I had no direction on what to round for example five, I rounded to two decimal places. So if you're not told, round to two. Um, otherwise, round to what you're told, so pay attention to directions. All right, so let's talk about another way to find solutions. And you're going to have to find solutions using tables of values. Um, and this is how solutions were found before we had a graphing calculator um, for problems that were a pain to try to factor. Like this one right here, the x cubed minus x minus 1. That's kind of a, a pain to factor, not going to lie. Um, and so we developed a method called tables. And the only reason why I want you to use the tables is because it gets that concept across from you that a zero shows a change in sign for the y values. Not necessarily x values, but a change in sign for the y values. And so we're going to use our table set on our calculator. So go to your calculator. Maybe I'll try to get, get it up here for this first one. So we're going to use our left uh, chart here, and I want you to go to second table set. And so for this first one, we're just going to go to the nearest tenth. We're going to start at 1, because we don't really know where the starting... Well, technically, I know my 0 is somewhere between 1 and 2. Agreed? Just by looking at the graph. So even if the graph... And let's assume the graph couldn't calculate the 0 for me. I know my 0 is between 1 and 2. Um, so that's why I'm starting at 1 on my table setup. Table start is at 1. See this change in table right here? See that change in table? We're going to go by tenths to start off because that's our least accurate decimal equivalency. So we're going to change that table set to 0.1. And so you might want to put here for your notes, change in table is equal to 0 0.1, so 1 tenth. 
and we are starting at 1 and we're going to change where we start at depending upon what happens here. And so I also want to change my independent variable for once. I don't want it I don't want it to ask. I want it to automatically calculate for me. So we're going to change ask to auto. So scroll down till auto is blinking and hit enter so that it is the only one that's blinking. So now you have auto auto. Then go to second table and it should have calculated it for you. Look at your table values, right? Do you see a sign change right here? We want to record this table of values on your paper. And then let's talk about the sign change. Notice our x's are going by tenths. So you should have been able to record up to 1.5. And then from there you're looking for a change in sign on the y values. So between 1.3 and 1.4 is where the sign change occurred. So I'm looking for a sign change. In case you don't remember from science a, uh, or from geometry, a triangle oftentimes means change. So that means that my zero is really not between 1 and 2. I've now narrowed it down to between 1.3 and 1.4. So I can get even more specific. So instead of going in increments of tenths, now we're going to stretch that out and go into increments of one hundredths. So for your second table, we're going to change, change table to 0.01. And you could start at 1, but why? Because we know that our 0 is somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4. So wouldn't we want to change our start to 1.3? Because I now know that I'm somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4. So go to table set. So second table set. I'm going to change the start to 1.3. I'm going to change the change table to 0 0.01 and leave it as auto auto. And then, are you okay with that? Okay, and then do second table. And now it's changed your numbers. And you can see that you're starting at 1.3 and it's going 1.31, 1.32, and so forth. And you should see a sign change in here, which we do between 1.32 and 1.33. And so we're going to record that table on our paper. So you can see that there's a sign change right here between 1.32 and 1.33 and you can see that it is approaching getting smaller and smaller and smaller and getting closer and closer to zero as it approaches that sign change and then once it hits the sign change it's now getting bigger and bigger and bigger and getting further away from zero. 
which is what the graph shows. So right here is the sign change. So now I know that my zero is between 1.32 and 1.33. So I can get even more exact by instead of going by one hundredths, what am I going to go by? A thousandths. And this is our last uh, set of our last table that we're going to do. So you're going to go back to table set and change table to read 0 0.001. What do you want to change your starting to? Instead of 1.3, where are you going to start it at? 1.32, because we know that somewhere between 1.32 and 1.33. So I'm going to go to second table set, change the start to 1.32, change the change table to 0 .001 and keep it as auto auto and then hit second table and then again you see another sign change and we'll leave it at that so we're going to record that on our paper And so finally, you should be able to see this sign change from a negative to a positive at 1.324 to 1.325. So somewhere between here is where your exact answer is, which does match up with what we did in example 5 above. Only this is more accurate than example 5 above. And you could keep going and going and going, but let's not, because that's not a whole lot of fun, is it? So you all right okay with that? You're looking for a sign change in Y. That's all the purpose of that problem was. All right, so then let's look at our final problem. And this one also is on your calculator. So there are two ways that you could do it. They want you to do it here by intersections. Looking at the intersections versus looking at the exact graph, are, the graphs look different. Okay, so I'm going to show the intersections graph on the paper, but I'm also going to show you what the real graph looks like so that you understand how we can still use intersections, even though the graph is different, to find the solutions. So this is an absolute value one. So for this one, um, go ahead and write, you've got way one would be if you used... Um, y equals absolute value of 2x minus 1, absolute value. And then to get 0 on one side of the equation, wouldn't I subtract 6? We can do that. And then that's wherever it crosses the x-axis would be the solution. That's way 1. Well, way 2 is just a different way of looking at it. Way 2 involves using intersections. So if we're going to do way 2, we're going to split up the original equation. Absolute value of 2x minus 1 equals 6. We're going to put the left side in a y equals, and we're going to put the right side into a y equals. So you've got two different equations. You're going to have y equals the absolute value of, and I'm going to do this in color on my graph so you can see which is which. So let's see. I'm going to do y equals the absolute value of 2x minus 1, and then I'll do y equals the right side 6. So those are the two things you're going to put into y equals. So let's just start off with putting the absolute value in first and not putting in the y equals 6. So go into your y equals, clear out the x cubed that's there, 
to get your absolute value signs, your absolute value signs are found underneath the math menu on your calculator. So we'll, we'll put in the um, commands here at the end. But you're going to click on math. And then I don't see any absolute value underneath the math menu under math. So you need to scroll to the right to the number menu. And the very first choice is ABS parentheses. That means absolute value. If you click enter, as I do here, mine's a newer calculator, immediately puts the absolute values in there. If you have an older calculator, it reads as ABS parentheses. And then you put your 2x minus 1 inside those parentheses. Um, so you just have to get to know your calculator. And, and my calculators in my classroom, they will have the ABS parentheses. You need to understand that that's the same thing. So then in those absolute value signs, you're going to put in the 2x minus 1. And I don't want you doing anything with a 6. I just want to look at the graph of 2x minus 1. It looks like a V, right? So from Algebra 3, 4, you should realize that, oh, yeah, that's right. Absolute values look like a V because it's bouncing that positive. Remember, y has to be a positive value because absolute value answers are positive. So it's bouncing off the x-axis to keep y positive. And so we need to find out where that minimum value is, which is a 0. I can either find a minimum value or I can find a 0. But I want to find out where is it hitting that because I'm trying to graph this, right? And so let's find that minimum value by finding a 0. So do second calc, choose 0, and they want left bound. Oh, you know what? They're probably not going to like this one. I'll show you why. They won't like using a 0 because 0, is, it's looking for what? What's the calculator looking for? A sign change. Is it going to find a sign change? Watch what happens. So you're going to hit enter. You're going to scroll to the right, hit enter, and enter again. It's not going to like it. Oh, it did. <laughs> I'm shocked. It did. Usually it's going to give me a syntax error. All right, so that's um, 0 0.50. So I'm going to graph this at halfway, right there. And then um, where should this be crossing the y-axis? I know it says negative 1, but what's the absolute value of negative 1? 1. So it's going to cross the y-axis at positive 1. And it'll be over here somewhere. So then just kind of estimate. Here we go. I can't draw a straight line, but you can. <laughs> Mine could be off because we're sketching it. All right, then we're going to put in enter y equals a 6. And isn't 6 um, a horizontal line going through the y-axis at 6? Okay, so where those two intersect, and we are running out of time, where those two intersect is the solution. You can find the intersection using the second calc intersect, and we will talk about that really quickly tomorrow as we start the lesson.